In this tutorial, you will learn how to build a full stack application using Next.js, a React framework, and Datastax's AstraDB for a cloud NoSQL database. Plus, we'll be using GitHub Copilot and AI Pair Programmer. The features we're going to build are list members, create members, and search members as you can see behind me. The prerequisites for this video, to complete it and make the most of it, you only need a few things. You just need Node.js installed, ideally version 12 or higher, and you need to create a Datastax account, and you can log in very easily with your GitHub account, and it's completely free. In this tutorial, we will be demonstrating the benefits of using Copilot, but this is not a requirement. Let me tell you a bit more about the tools we're gonna use. What is Next.js? Next.js is a React-based framework for building production-ready web applications that gives you the best developer experiences with all the features that you need for production. There are features like hybrid static and server rendering, TypeScript support, smart bundling, root prefetching, and so many more. Go check out the website to see a full list of features, link in the description below. So next up, what is Datastax's AstraDB? Well, Datastax built a data API gateway into Astra to give app developers a natural data API stack, which meshes well with the Jamstack or any other JavaScript front-end stack of your choice. Astra is built on the rock-solid NoSQL database engine Apache Cassandra, which powers Netflix, Instagram, Yelp, iCloud, and so many other apps we use every day. Cassandra is an open source project, no surprise there, this is me. What I really like about Astra DB is there's multiple ways to connect, to access your data. You could go over the REST API, or you could use GraphQL. And if you wanna get super powerful and efficient, you could actually use Cassandra QL, Cassandra Query Language. And there are also SDKs in your favorite languages like JavaScript and Python. In this tutorial, we'll be using AstraDB's document API and AstraJS JavaScript library, so we can read and write and do all the awesome CRUD things really easily. A link to sign up to Datastax for free in the description below. So I mentioned Copilot. What is GitHub Copilot? Well, it was introduced in June 2021, and it's an AI program which provides you with suggestions for your code, but not just a few characters or words of suggestions, but whole lines, actually entire functions right inside the VS Code editor, or code spaces if you have access to it already. To find out more about Copilot, which is currently in technical preview, there is a waiting list, link in description below. Let's get started, let's get coding, let's build something together. Let's start right at the beginning. Open the terminal and navigate to the directory you want to create your project in. So I'm in my repos folder, which is currently in my downloads folder, which is in my home directory. So what I'm going to do is do npx, create next app, and then the name of your project. So we'll say full stack next.js with data stacks. And we'll let npm do its magic and build the project for us. So now it's been built, it actually gives us some suggestions. Let me make this full screen. So it shows us how to run development environment. So let's do that. npm, oh, we must navigate into the directory first. I always forget that. So we navigate into the project that we just created, which is full stack next.js data stacks. So now we're in that folder, we can run that command that it's suggesting, npm run dev. So now it's running, it's saying it's running on port 3000 on the local host. So let's go have a look at that. And you can see, welcome to Next.js. So the app is up and running, it is working. Always good to check each time you take a step through building your project. So next thing we probably wanna do is open VS Code and let's make some changes and make sure the project reloads and everything works okay. So I'm gonna open another terminal because I'm gonna keep the project running. It's in the same folder that we're already in and I'm gonna open VS Code. And here we've got VS Code. And these are the project files and folders that have been created already for us. So there's a next folder, which is their config. Node modules that you're probably familiar with already. Pages, this is where our actual pages and components and API code is gonna go. Public folders where you have your pre-built assets like images. And we've got a styles folder. So let's make a change to what we've got so far. So here it says, welcome to Next.js. So let's change that and make sure everything's working and the reload is working. So I'm gonna delete the link. I'm just gonna say, welcome to Eddie Hub, exclamation mark. Hit save. The format has readjusted the page automatically. And we go here and you can see without me refreshing, that it's automatically loaded up, welcome to Eddie Hub. So that's great, that's really good. So we know the reload is working and any changes we make will automatically get displayed in the browser. That's so cool. 
But I also did mention the API folder. And so under pages, we have this API folder. Whatever we name the file is what the API path will be. So in this case, it's hello.js. If I open that, it returns a single object in JSON. So let's go visit that in the browser. So if we open another tab, I'll copy and paste that. And it was 3000 API hello. And you can see if I make that a bit bigger, name John Doe. So if we make a change to that just to make sure and change and say Eddie Hub, hit save. We will need to refresh this one and you can see now it says Eddie Hub. So we have got the API working immediately. Yes, it is with hard coded data and we're going to sort that out shortly. So we want to list our members. So what we should probably do is clear some of this example code and let's make a list. It will look a bit ugly, but we'll make it look prettier later on, I promise. Let's go back to the JS file, which has got our HTML in it. And let's clear most of this in main. So we'll say welcome to Eddie Hub, we'll keep that, but let's clear everything in here. Come all the way down to I think about here. Let's hit delete and have a look. Nope, we gotta delete one more. There we go. So next, let's make a list and we'll make it hard coded in the UI, in the HTML part, and then we'll move it to the API to be hard coded and then we'll move it to the database. And each layer won't know that if it's hard coded in the layer below or it's coming from real data, which is so cool. Let's make a list. So we use the UL, unordered list in HTML, and you can see Copilot is already suggesting to do an LI. Yes, thank you very much. And we will say member one. It's suggesting to close, brilliant. I'm gonna duplicate that line, member two, member three. Let's just hit save and have a look and see how that looks. There we go. So we have member one, member two listed here. That's brilliant. It looks awful and it's hard coded, but we've got it working. We're making sure that the UI is working as we go along each step of the way. So let's create a new endpoint that we can get data from and we'll call it members. So in the API folder, let's create a new file called members.js. And in here we need to export default function handler. And the handler will take two parameters, a request and response. Thank you very much, Copilot. And then we want to, with the response, we actually want to return a status of 200 and we want some data in there. So data we're gonna have that we're gonna need for our UI, as you saw from the beginning, is name, location, and GitHub. So we will say name, and here we can put member one, which we hard-coded in the HTML. We're gonna move that to here. And we're gonna say location, and we will say New York. And then we're gonna do GitHub, and we'll just say member one. So that's one piece of data. Let's, let's do another one. We mustn't forget this is gonna be an array of data, actually. We don't just want an object, so let me format that in. We close off the array. Okay, so it's gonna be one result. Let's just do a second result now, and we'll say member two, and we'll say they're in Paris. And they have GitHub user ID of member two. I wanna hit save, and we can go to the URL endpoint and check the API is working. So we've got the hello one. If I refresh this, this hasn't changed, but if we change this to members and hit enter, now we have two that are being served up as JSON. So in the front end, we have three, and we want to read the data from this API. Therefore, when we change it from hard-coded data in the API to the database, the front end is none the wiser, but we'll display the dynamic data. So let's go back to our HTML. At the top of our home function, we're gonna use useState function from React. This allows us to update data in our component and also maintain state. So what we'll do is we'll create a constant and the use state returns two items. It returns the data, in our case, members, but also returns a function to update members so we can, we can set it. And as you can see, it's Copilot has completed it for us and use state takes a variable. And what we want in there is our initial state. So we can initially start it off with an empty array. If I save that, nothing on the front end should change. Oh, use state is not imported. We must remember to import it. So we need to import use state from React. Now if we hit save, this will now work. As we can see, nothing has changed yet, but that's okay, we're slowly getting there. We now need to add a use effect function, which accepts a function that contains imperative, possibly effectful code. Well, mutations, subscription, timers, logging, other side effects are not allowed inside the main body of a function component. 
because doing so will lead to confusing bugs and inconsistencies in the UI. So instead we use the use effects function and the function past use effect will run after the render is completed to the screen. And by default effects run after every completed render. But you can choose to trigger them only when certain values are changed. So the function we're gonna pass to the use effect will fetch data from the API and then update the state with the uh, data using set members that we created before. You see Copilot's automatic completing for us already, so thank you very much. Wow, that's pretty good, Copilot. I really like that. Let's just hit tab and accept it. We do need to change the URL to be localhost and it was API forward slash members. We do want the response after the promise is completed, so in the then, to be use the JSON function. And then we also want to set members. Therefore, the data we've got back from that call, we want to use set members. But actually, this should be a capital M, and this should be a capital M as well. I'm sure some of you noticed that, so thank you very much for letting me know. Now, if I hit save again, nothing is going to change in the page. However, if we do open the terminal and you see the network traffic, one mistake that a lot of people make, myself included, is we'll use this code that Copilot completed for us, which was 99% of it, but there's actually an extra parameter missing, which is the initial start of the data. And if you don't include that, the API calls just keep looping over and over again. So what we need to do is actually put a comma, open close bracket, and that's our initial start refresh the page, now we make a members call. And you can see from the members data, you guessed it, we get two results. Member one and member two, New York and Paris, which is from the data we have here. So this is from our UI making a HTTP request, as you can see from there. We're not doing anything with the data yet though. So let's loop over this data, so therefore we can get the API to control the output data in the, in the UI. So what we need to do next is come down to this hard-coded data and we need to make it into a loop. So let's delete this. We actually do have the member's name, their location, and we do have their GitHub username. So if I save this and we look at the page, we can see now it's got those three items listed, but again, it's still hard coded. So let's loop over this. And the way you do this is we will, wow, Copilot is already completing it for us. Yes, so thank you very much, Copilot. So we'll use curly brace and we'll say with the members variable, map over each member. That sounds great. And we should close that off. And again, Copilot to the rescue. But one thing we will need to do is put in a key. This is needed so each item is unique in the HTML element. And what we'll do with the key is we will just use the member ID. And when we hard coded this, we didn't have a member ID. So we should add one because the database will give us one back. So let's say ID and we can just call it one. And then for the second one, we will call it two. Now, when we save it, you can see this is repeated twice. This is not the data we want. So let's actually make the data dynamic. So what we do here is for the name, we will just replace it with member name, a bit similar to member ID with the curly braces. Then location, we want member.location. And then for the username, we will do member.github. I think that's what we call it. Hit save. Oh, I missed a bracket over here. Now hit save, it's reformatted it for us. So now if we look at the web page, what do you think is gonna happen? It's actually updated to be member one, member two, New York and Paris, which is from our API, which we can see the data call here as well. Okay, now things are getting exciting. Things are getting dynamic. So what do you think we do next? Next, we need to connect our API from being hard-coded data to being dynamic data from the database. To do this, we need to go to Datastax. From the link in the description below, you'll be presented with a page like this. And you can create a new account, or I just log in with GitHub, and it goes really quickly You're in a few seconds. And you can see your dashboard with the different databases, uh, your credits, and you get $25 of free credits per month, which is really hard to consume. It's like 40 gigs of storage data. I can't remember how many millions of reads and writes. I use this a lot, and I've still got loads of credit remaining. So let's create a new database. I'll call this videos, or maybe YouTube. Let's call it YouTube. I need to create a key space. I'm gonna create a key space for each video that I do. So this one is Next.js. And what a key space is, it's like a namespace. It's allowing you to segregate your data from other data. And you might think, Eddie, that, that's just a table. Well, yes and no. Namespaces or key space allow you to group your tables, your collections together. So if you had 
Let's just say you had members, which we're creating at the moment, but you had members for different communities. Rather than putting them all in the same collection or same table, where every time you did a query, you'd have to add a filter to say, only bring out the ones from this community. But with the key space, you would just put the key space of the community in the path and you don't need to do any extra filtering. It'll automatically bring out all the relevant data, which is so awesome. So we'll say Next.js. And you can choose if you want to host it on Google Cloud, AWS, or Azure. I will choose Google Cloud. And you can choose where you want, North America. I'm going to choose Europe. And you've got Belgium. OK, let's host it there. And it gives you some ideas of cost. But again, we've got $25 per month, which takes a lot to use. Again, I'm struggling to use $2 at the moment. Hit Create. It takes a moment to create it. And you can see the database now is listed here below. And it's pending. It's Cassandra. It's got a few moments to get started because it's building that redundancy and that scalability that you really want. And if you click on the database, you can now see I've got my key space, Next.js. I can always create one when I do my Angular video, my Svelte video. I've done the Nuts video already, but I put that in like my test database. But you know, this is actually a better way to get organized. And you can see these two databases are green, and this one is still orange because it's still building it. But while that's going, we can do the next step, so don't worry. Once it's finished creating the database, you have extra tabs along the top. So you've got Health, Connect, CQL, that's Cassandra Query Language Console, and Settings. So let's go to Connect. And here you've got some examples using a document API, you've got GraphQL, REST, as I mentioned before. You also can connect uh, via these drivers as well and also use uh, their Datastax SDKs for ease as well. But first thing you must do is create a token. And you can click here and create a token. And what that does, it takes you to your organization so you can create tokens. And when you generate a token, you select the role that you want it to have. For the token to be able to create data and add data and read data, I would say use database administrator. And it lists the abilities of what you'll be able to do with this token. Remember, treat tokens like your password. And then you can generate the token. When you've got your token created, it will give you three items. And you can download these so you don't lose them for later. But remember, treat these like passwords and don't share them with your friends. We will have no data in our database. So if we change the list, from reading from the hard-coded data in our API to reading from data stacks, nothing's going to come out. We are planning to create a form so we can save data. So we could get data in that way, or we could just use curl commands. So I can show you how to do that as well. So I've got this curl command to create data from their documentation. And you can see they've put in, put in your DB ID, your DB region, and then also your key space and then your token comes up here. You can see that clearly in the dollar and the, the capital writing, and then you can write the data that you want. So let's give that a go. And you can get your region and your key space already pre-populated in the documentation on the connect tab. So here we go, we've got the database ID, and then next up is the region, which in this case is Europe West one, and then the key space is Next.js, and you can see this is in the URL path. And then down here, we need to do the token. And you will need these later on for the, our application as well. So go back to my token. And this data that I want to enter is not title some stuff. We want to enter. So what did we have on our web page? We had member one, member two, New York, Paris. Let's enter something slightly different so that we know it's actually working from the database. What did we call it in our UI? We said name, location, and GitHub. So we will have name. And name can be do my name. And then next up, we wanted uh, location. I'm currently in Portugal. And then we wanted one more. Oh, I hit enter already. I had a comma and then there's a JSON. So I put a comma in and hit enter, but I meant to start a new line. So that's my mistake. So let me hit up and go edit this again. So I could put it on the same line to avoid me hitting enter and making the mistake. So what I can do here is I can say GitHub and it will be edit out. No comma on the last item, hit enter. And you can see it's created and it's given me an ID back. So that's now work. Let's just do a couple more. So using the same credentials and same information, we can just change the name. We can say Sarah and we can say Sarah is in London and Sarah's GitHub username is Sarah. Hit enter. We'll get a second ID, so now we've got two. Right, if we go back to our browser and refresh, nothing has changed. We haven't connected it yet. We are almost there. 
So to be able to use the SDK, we need to do npm install Astra JS collections. And this adds it to our project in our package.json file. Next, we want to create an env.local file. This allows us to safely put our credentials in this file and it won't get committed because it should be in the git ignore. I highly recommend adding .env star to your global git ignore. I add a few other things to mine as well. Going to the uh, AstroDB documentation for AstroJS collections, you can see that I've done this step already. That's great. And now it's saying we need to do some exports. We don't need the exports, but we do need to set these properties in the .env file so it can be read by application. So I want to be lazy and I'm just going to copy that. I'm going to paste it in here, but we just want this bit right at the end for now because it's an env file. And make sure I name them correctly. It's going to be equals, that's going to be equals, and that's going to be equals. So uh, db id, we already had that from our curl command. So I can grab that there. And then we need our region, which is Europe West 1. And then we need our token again, which we added here. So now we've got that set, I can close that file and we don't hopefully have to open it again and therefore there's no risk of me sharing any tokens. Let's go back to the documentation and see what they say next. So next they say to import the collections package, which makes sense. So we're here in our API file and we want to import that next. And then it's saying to create a client. So let's create the client. So now we've created the client. Now it's suggesting to make a constant which has access to the namespace and the collection we want just for ease. So I think that's a, that's a great idea. So let's have a look. So we can say it will be members collection and we're going to want to do Astra client collections members. That is correct, but we missed out namespaces. So Codepilot, you were pretty good, but not perfect. And so the namespace we said was next.js. And the next, we can just do a find. So there's different things you can do. You can filter by name. You have these different operators, which I'm going to show you towards the end. But we could just do a find of an empty object. So next thing we can do in here, we could say const members equals members collection find. But Codepilot, we don't need to array. We do need an empty object in there. And then we can replace this data with members. But one thing you'll notice, we will need to put uh, an async await because they have it in their documentation and we haven't done it yet. So on this, we will do an await, which means we will have to make this function async as well. Let's hit save. I need to move this inside the function because it is an await on it as well. It's fine, we can just move that there, hit save. So now it's the same code, I've just moved it inside the function and then this should work. Actually, I probably need to restart the app because I added a new NPM dependency. Now that's running, let's go to read here. Ah, it's already loaded, refresh, it's already here. Perfect, so this is the actual data, this is the ID we had in our terminal. This is the data we added from the curl CLI command. But what you'll notice is the ID is not a field, it's actually the key, which has its pros and cons, but we actually want to make it as part of the collection and the object field. So we can just do um, a simple map to do that. So what we can do is we could say object keys. And that's pretty good. It's already completed it for us. Thank you very much, Copilot. But we do need to add the ID. So in the return, we do want to have the ID in there. So what we'll need to do is say ID will be key, and then we want to spread the object that has the data we need for that object. I need one more bracket. I hit save, it should format it a lot more readable. Let's refresh the page and have a look. Now you can see it's now not objects, it is a collection of objects. So we've got ID in there. That was pretty, pretty straightforward. If you have any questions or another way to do that, leave a comment below. And while you're there, if you're enjoying this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe and hit the bell button so you get notified every time I go live and post a video. It all really helps support the channel. Engagement really helps the YouTube algorithm. So any feedback, suggestions, comments below really help. So now we've got the API updating. The UI was connecting to the API before because yes, it was hard coded, but hard coded in the API. So the UI doesn't need to know that we've changed the data from being hard-coded in the API to being a real database. So if we go to the front end, it should just work. Do you see it reload? It just worked. It went from member one, member two, to 
Eddie and Sarah. So let's add one more in the command line and see if that worked. So if we go back here, and if I bring up this command line, and this is where how we're inputting data, we will create a form so we won't have to do this and we can do it via the application. So let's add another person. So let's add my awesome video editor, Alona. And Alona is in Ukraine. And Alona might or might not have a GitHub username. I think Alona does, but we'll just write Alona for that. Not correct. And hit send. We get an ID. If you look at the ID, it says 4CA00 at the end. Yeah, so we can see if that comes through. So let's head to the API, refresh. There should be a third one in, the, in there. And you can see for Alona, it is 4CA00. And if we head to the UI, we do need to do a refresh because there is no WebSockets to push to the UI. So it doesn't know there's been a change. Hit a refresh. We now have a third person. So this is working directly from the database. This is your full stack application. But currently, we're only reading from the full stack application from the database all the way to the front end. So we are going to do some writing and we are going to style this up and make it look a lot better. Next up, let's do a little bit of basic styling. There are loads of options to choose from, Bootstrap, Material Design, Tailwind, but for to keep things simple, we're just gonna use Bootstrap. I'm actually gonna use React Bootstrap. So now we can go to our front end and we can add the imports Bootstrap and I wanna import list groups. Because if we go to the documentation on here and we look at the components, we can see all these loads of options that we can choose from, but I wanna go to list groups. And you can see this is how you use it with this component. Have a read through the documentation. I'll put a link in the description below. So now we've got this group. We want to replace this data, which is dynamic and looping over it correctly. But we want to not use basic HTML. We want to use Bootstrap and the React components. So what we'll do here is do list group. And we must make sure the closing one matches. And then we change the li to be list group item. List group dot item and obviously the closing one as well. Now if we hit save, hopefully that will look a lot nicer. And you can see straight away, that looks a lot nicer. There's so many more things you can do. You could put a picture of someone, a thumbnail, and then have the writing, kind of the heading, and their name bigger underneath, smaller. We're just gonna keep it really, really simple for now. So that looks really good, I think. But next we wanna save data. So we need to add a form and then get that data from the form to our API and get the data from the API to the database. That might sound scarier than it is, but trust me, it's really quite straightforward once you see how. So let's add a form above the list. And from the documentation, it is form, and we want it in line is the style, and you can see it's VS Code has automatically completed that for us. And we'll create an input group. And then next up, we'll have a form control. And this is the actual input, so we will need, thank you very much, Copilot, text, yes. Placeholder, not username, but we can change that to name. What else do you give us? On change is correct. We want the event. Thank you very much, Copilot. That's not quite correct. We're actually going to set name, which we haven't created yet. So we'll create that in a moment. We want to set name and we're going to want to do e target value. So, yes, Copilot, that is correct. And we could do this all on one line. And then I think we can close it. So that's one field. We need a few more. So we can duplicate these lines and we're going to have that's name. And then next we were going to have location and then we're going to have GitHub. And we must say set location and set GitHub. This is not going to work at the moment because we haven't set these. So what we need to do is actually use the use state that we did before. So here we've got use state for members. So we also need one for each of those. So we will say constant and we will need one for name and we will want set name. This is how we're going to set the variable. And the use state default is going to be an empty string. And we'll duplicate these lines and we're going to do one for location and we're going to do uh, the same for the set. It's going to be an empty string as well. And the same for this one is going to be GitHub. And we will say set GitHub with a capital H. Spell it the right way so GitHub doesn't get upset. Make sure I've done the same here, capital H there as well. Perfect, hit save. Form is not defined. We did not import form, that is correct. We did import these ones, but form, we didn't let it autocomplete for us, so it didn't do it. So here we go, now we've got a form, but what you'll notice is we don't have a submit button. So what we'll do is we'll append the button to the group. So here we can say input group append. What we want to append is the button. So we say button and we will 
have a variant. These are the different styles. You'll see it from the documentation, but we will outline it as a secondary. And then on click, we want to submit the form as well. We haven't created that yet. So let me leave that off for the moment. Hit save and let's see how that looks. Oh, I haven't added a, a button yet either. Ah, I mean, it doesn't like it being empty, so that's fine. So we can say submit save function, which we haven't got yet. So what we can do actually, we're gonna to have to do this anyway. We can go up here under the use effect. We can say const submit save. And we will want to prevent the default of actually the form being submitted. And we want to console log the data, which is name, location, and GitHub. Perfect. Now if we hit save, it's reformatted it for us. And this looks a bit odd. Our button is not quite right. Why not? The button needs some text. Well done, Eddie. So in here, we will put save. We save, we hit save, it will reformat it for us, which is great. That looks a lot better. So it's not going to save to the database. So if I put test name one, test location one, and I just GitHub test one, uh, it's not going to save the data. So our list is not going to get updated, but we should see it in the console. So hit save. You can see it's the information that we've just typed in to the fields. So perfect. So we know the submit is working and we know it's grabbing that data. So next, we just need to send this to our API. And it's very similar to the use effect fetch. We are going to use a fetch, but we're going to do a post rather than a get. A post allows you to have a body where we're going to include the data, whereas a get, it's just a URL. You can have query strings on the URL when you have that kind of question mark query equals like a search term. But for a post, we need to actually send a resource. In this case, our member. Oh, it's already auto completing it for us. That looks pretty good. The difference here, we're going to say method post. Wow, Copilot, thank you very much. And we are going to send some headers. We want it to be JSON. Brilliant. Close that. And next, we want to stringify our data, which in our case is name, location, GitHub. And then we do also want to get the response. So in this case, we'll take the JSON response and we won't quite update the page just yet. Let's see how this works. We can do a page refresh and then I can show you how to uh, make it a bit more, even more dynamic and better user experience. So if we go to our API, it's always going to be doing a get. It's not going to do anything, but we can put a console log and just check we're getting the data in our API. So we could say if it's a post, that's pretty close. We want to say method is equal to a post. That's correct. Then we want to get the body. Thank you very much. Um, we don't need a collection for now. We could just do a console log. And if we hit save, let's give that a go. So we should see the console log not in the browser, but in what we've got running here. So if I clear that, that's our running app when we ran npm run dev. And let's have a look if we submit this now, we do get our object. So that's coming through correctly. And if just to prove it, I'll change this one to a two, hit save again, and you can see it's come through a second time with two in it. So our API is getting this data. So that's pretty straightforward. So next, we want to uh, send the data to Datastax to actually save it in the database. So what I recommend is not sending the data we get on the API because you can't trust it. So what we probably want to do is create a new object and pull out the data that we need. So let's create constant, let's say member, singular, and we are going to create this, and this is going to be name, and we're going to say body.name, and then it's going to be location, and it's going to be body.location, and it's going to be GitHub, and you guessed it, body.github. And the reason for that is if someone posts in some other information, we don't just want to save it in our database, we only pull out the information that we need. When we do come into a post, we should do a return at the end because we don't want it to run into our get section. But one thing I have noticed, this part we should move to the top because we will need the client to connect. So we should put the post after we create the client and get the collection. And then if it's not a post, it will do the get by default. And if it is a post, it will create it, which we're going to add now. Let's head back to the Astra documentation. You'll see how straightforward it is to do a create. So we already have the collection and we have these find examples or find one. Here's the create. Like it's almost exactly the same as the, the find. So it's really straightforward. So all we would do here is say, Copilot, you got it pretty pretty close, not quite 100% right. So we could say const new member equals, it will be an await, 
and we already have an async on the function above, so that's fine. It will be the members collection, but it won't be insert, it will be create. And then we do want to do a response, so the UI might want to display this user or append it like we're going to. So we will do res JSON new member, that is correct. But we do want to change the status code, but you do want to return a 201 rather than a 200. But now, the problem here is we will just get returned the ID. That's what gets, comes back from data stacks when we create a new resource. So we've already got the data. So we could do a find for that ID and actually get the data out, but we've got the rest of the data. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, what we want to return is ID, the new member dot document ID. That's what um, data stacks calls it. And then, yeah, we want to spread the new member data that we had just saved. Save. I mean, that is not that scary. It is literally a couple of lines. So now if we go back to the UI and if I do, if I refresh this, you just see the list stays the same because we haven't done anything yet. If I say test three, this will save it, but will not appear on the list until we do a refresh, but we will fix that in a moment. What I want to show you is the post request in the um, console. So now if I hit save, members went out, we got a 201 back. And if I click on it and go to what was sent, you can see that what was sent was our data, so the request payload. And if we go to the response, the response came back out ah, with two items, came back with the same ID, but document ID and ID, but not the rest of the data. So I need to fix that. Oh, I did new member. That should be member, not new member. So if I hit, uh, hit save, and then let's try again. If I change this to four to make sure it's our fourth one and hit save again. Now for the next one, it's still a 201, but you can see the preview now is correct. ID is the ID and it's got the data that we submitted. If I refresh, we should see three and four get added. So five in total to refresh, you can see three and four got added. That's brilliant, but it'd be nicer if the UI automatically updated. We can do that really easily. So all we do is go back to our front end and now we know that response that we get back will actually have the data that we want to append. So what we can do, uh, yes, Copilot, I think that looks pretty good. Let's hit save and see what happens. So we will say name five, location five, GitHub five, hit save, and it automatically gets appended to the list. And if I refresh it, it is still there in the list, so it's persisted in our database. So next, let's add a search. Let's use the database operators like equal to or greater than. We'll use equal to in this one. We haven't really got anything greater than like dates or numbers, but it's very easy. You just change EQ to greater than like GT. So what we'll do, let's create a form field where it's a search. So if we can come down to here. Let's create it above the title. So I'll put it above the H1. And what we want to do again, we want to create another form We'll do it in line as well. And we will have, again, an input group. And we'll have a form control just like before. And it's gonna be text. It's gonna have a placeholder of not name. We will say search. And on change, we don't wanna set name. We wanna set keyword. Well, I can change this to be keyword to match as well. And yes, I'd like to close that. Okay, brilliant. And we still do need a button. So we will need to do, like before, input group that we want to append. And then inside that, we will do the same type of button we had before. We will have an outline style. And on click, we won't want to do submit save, we want to do submit search. And I mustn't forget to put in the text for the button this time, and we close off the button. So now if we hit save, we'll probably get an error because we haven't got this function as a variable. Let's have a look and see what happens. Yes, it makes sense. So what we need to do, is as you like before, we need to have a variable. So we'll just say const, and it is gonna be the keyword. And we're gonna say set keyword, it completed it for us. Thank you very much. Where's that in brackets? I need brackets around that. So now we've got the variable where we're gonna save the uh, search term. And next, we actually need another function like this submit one. So we'll say const, and we'll say submit. I think we called it search, is that correct? Like before, we'll prevent default. And we're going to, yep, do a fetch on that. And it's gonna be a get. So we can do very similar to the first one we did, which is then we're gonna return the response and then we're gonna set the members with it. And that's it. The difference on this one is we're gonna to wanna to pass a query parameter. So we will append this with keyword equals, and we will put in here keyword. 
So whatever we type in the field will get sent to the query. So let me show you. It's not gonna work. We haven't told the API to handle this yet, but I want to show it to you working. So if I type in the keyword, oh, I spelled key, typo. Key work, no, key word. There we go. Happens to everybody. So if I do test keyword, I hit search, I simply refresh it to clear up the stuff on the side. So I just say test 111, hit search. You can see a query is made like before. So this was the members list. But this is the members list again, the same path, but you can see on the URL that it's got been appended keyword equals test. It's been uh, URL encoded, but 1111. But the result coming back is exactly the same. It's all of the results because we haven't told the API to do any filtering or searching yet. But you know, we're getting there, we're close. Again, you're gonna see how straightforward it is just to make the list that we already got working filter down on whatever filters you want, really. So if we go back to our API, we can close hello, we're not using that anymore. And we wanna to go to the get part. So this is down here, so not in the post, this defaults down to the get. But what we want to do is before it does the find, we want to do a check. So we wanna say if request query dot keyword exists, then we wanna do a slightly different query. And then we can put an else and do the query that we had already, which is this uh, find with no parameters. So I wanna remove the const up. So let's move this over here. And this will be members will equal that and we'll close off that. So just before the condition, we will say members equals an empty array. And then in here, we can also say members equals, and just like with this find, we can put it up here, but we wanna put some parameters in here because we have got a query term to search with. Here we'll do name, because that's the property we wanna search against. And then we will create another object in here. And what we'll do is we'll do equals, and yeah, request query keyword. Perfect. So, hope that makes sense. So if there, a request comes in with the keyword added to the query string, we'll do a find using the query string, which is an equals on the name field. Otherwise, if not, we'll just do the normal list that we did before. So if I hit save, and go back to our list. Let's do a refresh. Oh, what I've lost. Aha, it should be a let, not a consonant. Hit save, the API should rebuild, should be fine. Perfect. Refresh the UI. Okay, so we've got the list of everything and we can add people. So let me do a search for something that doesn't exist. So if I just say error, that doesn't exist in the list, hit search, there's no results. And if I refresh the page, it goes back to the beginning, shows us all of the results. But if I search for Eddie, should get one result. We do, but let's just prove it works. We didn't do a find one, we did a find. So let's create another Eddie. And Eddie is also in London sometimes, but I have the same GitHub username. So if I hit save, now you can see it's added it to the list. But let's do a refresh. Let's start again from the beginning. There is Eddie in Portugal and there is Eddie in London. So if I search the keyword for Eddie again, hit search. Now you can see we've got two results coming from the database. And we can see that also in the console, in the developer tools, the first request returned all of them. And then this one went with a keyword and you can see you got two results, which is the two results we see here. The other operators you can use, I'll bring up my screen now, equal, not equal, greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than, equal to, in and not, with, not within. And there are more and more operators coming all the time. So to summarize, what did we create? We created a full stack application using Next.js, which is a React framework, using Datastax's NoSQL serverless database for free in the cloud. And we created an API, which managed the data between the database and our React application, where we were able to save data from our form, our nicely styled bootstrap form, and we were able to list the data and search it. Let me know in the comments below what projects you create and what yours look like. I look forward to seeing what features you use, what it looks like. The great thing about using these tools is you get to build something really quick using open source tools. But not only is it quick, like if you're using hackathons or side projects, but also if you want something to scale, if your project takes off, this will scale with you, which I think is excellent. Don't forget to join our Discord. We chat on Discord between videos and live streams. Link in the description below and share your GitHub open source projects with us there. I do review open source projects on my live stream as well. I love seeing what people do, what tools they use, and how they use those tools to create some interesting projects. I'll see you in the next video.